Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast. This is the SC Etc. Series and episode 188. I'm Chris Hanagi, CEO and founder, CEO and founder. Wow, I can't even say what I am of Social Engineer LLC, the Institute for Social Engineering and the Innocent Lives Foundation. I've been hosting this podcast since when was it? Boy, I can't even remember. It's a long time. That's how long it is. 2009. And on this series, my trusty co-host is none other than Mr. Layer 8 himself, Patrick Laverty. Patrick, nice to have you here. Oh, it's always so much fun to be here. It's uh, great to see you again, Chris. Yeah, really good to be together for this one. I'm excited about this topic. But before we get to that, let's talk about a few housekeeping. Uh, the sponsor for this uh, episode, as, as well as um, all of our episodes lately, has been Social Engineer. That's our company I just talked about. If you have anything of interest in your company, you want to help protect your human firewall, you want to start looking at social engineering services that cover vishing, phishing, smishing, uh, SE teaming, red teaming, you should check out our website and see what we can do to help you out there. Also, our whole host of training classes, uh, which we'll be talking a lot about in this episode, is now on the website for 2023. So we have an APSE class here in Orlando in January, and then there's an online OSINT class, an online CIRA class. And for those of you who have been to APSE, we'll be shortly making the announcement about our MLSE class also for 2023. So stay tuned for all of that. You could check all of that out on social-engineer.com. If you like anything to do with social engineering at all, you should definitely get into our Slack channel. We have, I think it's like 13, 14, 1500 people in there now. Uh, every day talking about the principles of psychology that that are used in social engineering from physical social engineering to using it in everyday life and all aspects of your life. We even have a group that gets together every uh, once every a couple times a month, I think, and they do practice sessions. Uh, we have a job board. Nine people have now found employment uh, because of that job board there. So if you want to jump on in, you can see the link in the show notes or you can hit me up or Patrick up on Twitter. You'll be able to uh, get the link from us right there. And Patrick's very active in that channel. So if you want to chat with him, you can come on in and give us ideas for future episodes of this podcast. Uh, also, I want to invite everyone who's listening to this to hop on over to innocentlivesfoundation.org and check out the amazing work that the team is doing over there. We have now went over 477 cases that we've submitted to law enforcement. I am so proud of the team there. Our mission is to work closely with law enforcement, not as a vigilante group. We're not doing any of that kind of stuff. We work with, with law enforcement to uncover, unmask, and geolocate people who are trafficking children and creating child abuse material. And because of that, we have 477 cases that we're able to help close and hopefully getting some really bad people off the streets and into prison. Um, with that, I'd love to also invite everyone to check out pro-rock.com. Why? Because it's the home of the best rock and roll band on the planet. And if you are listening to this podcast on Spotify or iTunes or one of the other audio providers, then you are getting a intro and outro of a beautiful clutch song. Uh, they have gladly let us use this music so that we can uh, introduce the world to their awesomeness. And Neil is a part of ILF. So, of course, we're very happy to uh, promote them as they are to promote us. So check them out. Um, okay. I think that's about it, Patrick. So let's talk about our topic. What is our topic right. for today? All right. So I think what we wanted to talk about today is you probably get this question all the time because I get this question frequently. <laughs> the question is, I want to be a social engineer. So how can I learn how to do that legally? And it's often not the easiest question to answer because you can't tell somebody, you know, go try to break into a building, you know, <laughs> after hours, go see, you know, start jiggling the handle at doors and see if you can get in. <laughs> That's probably not really the best advice. And it's no. probably also not good advice to say, just call up a company and see if you can get somebody's password out of them. No, don't do that either. Don't do that. And don't start sending people emails with links in them and malware in them. Those Don't are all bad ideas. Bad ideas. So those are bad, bad <laughs> ideas. So I, I guess what I wanted to talk with you about is what are some of the good ideas? What are some of the ways that people can learn how to do these types of things legally without getting in trouble? And also, are there any ways for people who are currently in college to learn these types of things? Are there places that if somebody is thinking about their future and they want to get into social engineering, should they try to learn these types of things in college? 
Or I guess later on, we can talk about if you're not in college anymore, what are some of the options? So yeah. how do you usually answer that question? How do you become a social engineer? That's a that's a really heavy question, Patrick. And you're right. It is something we get asked a lot in our Slack channel, through email, um, when we're at conferences. A lot of people want to know how they get into this field. Um, you know, a lot of times I start off with when people say, how can I practice social engineering? So forget about the field for a second. I usually tell people it's no more than just practicing having conversations with random strangers. And then, when you know, and I've known people who go went through improv classes and things like that, that have really helped them become more comfortable in having everyday conversations. Now, with that said, that's not going to help you get into the field. That will just help you become more comfortable talking to people. Um, so there are, there are, and, and I really, I think we should start a little bit with your, with your question about college, because let's back up to the beginning, right? People are, young people are in university right now, and they may be like, I really want to be an infosec. This seems like the, the place I want to be. And, um, and what should I take to be prepared for that? Uh, so let's actually start there because like, I'm going to sound like an oxymoron for a minute, maybe with an emphasis on the moron, because I recently in the last couple of years had the privilege of becoming the world's first professor of social engineering for the University of Arizona. So uh, obviously I support university education and I think it's important. Uh, at the same time, I say that you don't need it to get into this field. Right. I, I think most of my team uh, that we have here at SECOM, uh, if they have degrees, those degrees are not in anything to do with InfoSec. Uh, they have completely different degrees if they have any. And most of us have certifications in, in InfoSec. And those certifications seem to be a lot more valuable for us as a team than the degrees that we have. Um, now, with that said, um, one of the reasons I said yes to tr teaching at University of Arizona, uh, because I've been asked a lot at different universities, was many of them try to teach the concepts of social engineering, but they do it from people who have zero experience. They don't know anything about SE. Um, they've never done it in their real life. So all they're teaching is stuff that they read in books. And that has always, for me, been the problem with university infosec degrees is I have someone who comes out. They have a bunch of great letters after their name. They've they've passed every test with A's. They're 4.0 GPA, but then when I hand them an actual thing to do, they don't know to how to actually do it. So um, University of Arizona has allowed me and others that they've invited to make a very practical class where when you come through that class, you are actually fishing people. You're fishing people. Yeah, we've had uh, six students last semester break into buildings under supervision. Um, the, the I don't teach this part, but the OSINT class that is taught by Cynthia Hetherington, they actually do real life OSINT on real life targets. You know, they're they're doing things that when they exit that program, if any of them were to walk in and see you and me, Patrick, we'd be like, hey, tell me your experience. They bam, here's a report. I've done all this. That adds a lot of value, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the things that we could probably tell college students that if you want to get into this field, probably one of the biggest things that you can do to make yourself marketable is to learn how to write a report. Yes. Could you imagine if, like, for example, I'm guessing that in all the times that you've been at conferences and all the times that you have been approached by people looking for a job, they probably usually tell you, I really know how to do fishing. I really know how to send a fish. Have you ever had somebody come up to you and say, I want to be a social engineer because I can write a really good report? <laughs> Never. As a matter of fact, I have people all the time saying, I know I'd be a great SE because I'm great at talking to people. And I'll ask them, so tell me about your report writing uh, experience in other careers you've had. And they're like, what? And I'm like, you know, <laughs> writing, because I said the client is not paying us to be super cool. The client is paying us for that piece of paper at the end that tells them what our super cool stuff unleashed and uncovered so they could fix it. So they're paying for that piece of paper. And if our piece of paper is written like garbage, they're going to equate our service to being like garbage. So, yeah, I, 100 percent. That's a great suggestion, by the way, for anyone that's in college. As boring as it is, take a report writing class. Absolutely. And and there's the semi-famous quote that goes around in the infosec industry that I hack for free. I get paid to write reports because <laughs> right. the, the, the report is what the client is always going to have. If it's not in the report, 
it didn't happen. It doesn't matter all these great things that you do. If it's not in the report, they don't know about it. They don't know that that's going to be an issue, especially maybe six months down the line when they're like, oh, remember that test that we got? Let's go back to that report and see if we did we remediate everything. Yeah. Or what's even worse is sometimes if they come back to me after I wrote the report and they're like, oh, well, did you do X, Y, Z? And in my head, I'm like, yeah, I know I did. It's not in the report. So I'm just like, oh, man, I can't remember the details of that. that okay. So that's where the skill in writing the report is super huge in being a professional consultant in this industry. And that's a really good suggestion for anyone listening. I mean, regardless if you're in college or not, um, because when we interview with people, we oftentimes ask that question. And if they have zero report writing experience, but then someone next to them has less SE experience, but more report writing experience, man, I can teach you the SE stuff. But having to teach someone how to write a report is painful. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm that, that's a that's a great one. Um, now I'm not downing all the other college courses, right? I'm not saying everyone should come to, to the one I teach at University of Arizona. Of course not. Uh, I'm sure. And I haven't, I haven't done an extensive review of every university out there and what they teach. So there may be other amazing programs. Uh, we had a wonderful professor from a university on our podcast once, and, uh, she was doing a very advanced form of teaching SE, even though she admittedly, and she told the students, I have no experience in this. So I'm only using materials from like people like myself and others that have years of experience. But then she would collaborate with people like, uh, like me and others to help build exercises for her students. And, um, and, and she's doing a great job at that right now, from my understanding. So I know there's others out there that people can find. But, you know, let's move on to actually like some of the other things. So one of the things that uh, I always talk about when people say, if I want to be in the field, like what, where do I focus my, the education I want? Um, the first thing I'll say is OSINT, uh, open source intelligence gathering is the lifeblood of every social engineer engagement we ever do. I don't care if you're fishing, if you're vishing, if you're smishing, if you're breaking in a place, if you're just planning a elicitation engagement, you have to know how to do OSINT. So I always tell people your first basis for education should be OSINT related. And under that, there are a lot of training options out there. Absolutely. And also, any time that we are trying to come up with pretexts for an engagement, one of the things that we really focus on and try to make sure of is that all of our actual our, our actions, our pretexts are completely based off of the OSINT that we have found. We can't just go into a social engineering engagement and figure this is a cookie cutter, one size fits all pretext for the engagement yeah. because every company is not the same. Every situation, every campaign is not going to be the same. What we really need for our social engineering to work is for it to be believable. And based on that OSINT, we can really then make our pretext to be so much more believable because one of the things that we are really looking to learn is often just the lingo that a company uses. For example, I was recently doing some, some uh, phone calls, some vishing with a company. And one of the things that I, I learned as I was talking to people is sometimes they would ask, because I would tell them that I'm from the IT department, they would ask, oh, are, are you one of the twos? <laughs> Um, yes, uh, I'm one of the twos. And they're like, okay, great. Cause the, the twos are usually who I contact for help at the IT department. I'm like, absolutely. Yes, uh -huh. that is who I am. Because guess what I did on the next phone call? Uh, you're I part said, of the twos. <laughs> Hi, th this I'm Bob. I'm calling from the twos. At <laughs> now I've built up all that additional rapport yeah. with the person based on that additional um, information that we were able to gather. So those are some of the ways that OSINT can really help for a pretext to work. So I guess a lot of people will ask, then, how do you learn this, right? Um, yes. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of things that I know I found. And again, this is not an extensive, exclusive list. Um, these are just things that I know. And I can't talk about things I've never taken or things that I, I haven't heard about. But like I've I've taken personally, and a lot of my team has taken Nick Ferno's uh, CSI Tech's OSINT class. Uh, very advanced uh, material there. They do a lot of really interesting mathematical things when it comes to that, but also advanced Google dorking and things like that. Uh, I've taken that class personally, I think two or three times. I, I've enjoyed it that much. Um, I know some of our team have taken Michael Bazell's training online. Um, and, and, uh, he offers, I mean, he writes that novel of a book. I don't know how he puts one out every year because things are changing all the time in the OSINT world. So he focuses more on 
search engines and tools. Whereas, um, like, uh, Ferno's class focuses more on the critical thinking, less tools and more of the how to think about OSINT and then use just a browser to do it. Uh, Basil focuses on tools. So there's two different aspects. And then, and then we have our class. Uh, social engineer has an OSINT class. And what we did for that is we kind of looked out at the market and we saw, that there was a lot of like, you know, hardcore punch you in the face OSINT classes. And there was a lot of like Bazell's type of, hey, here's all of these tools and here's how you can learn to use them. And what was missing was what we do every day. See, I'm not doing the, um, uh, you know, here at SECOM, maybe ILF is different, but we're not doing the finding a missing person OSINT. We're doing the, I got to look at your corporate website and your corporate um Twitter account and Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn. And I got to come up with pretext, just like you said, come up with pretext for one of our attack vectors. Um, And our OSINT class teaches how to basically do corporate end to end investigations. So how you could start with something as simple as a name and email address and end with a full profile on this person that gives you, you know, three, five, 10, 20 different pretext vectors that you can use to then infiltrate that person with different types of, of, of attacks. So, um, you know, of course I'm biased. Our class is, uh, is really good and it's taught by Ryan. Um, it's a two day class that ends with its own little like certification engagement. So you actually have a, like a three to four hour, uh, OSINT challenge that certifies that you basically accomplished everything in the, clo- in the course and understand it. Um, but, you know, like I said, there's other options out there, but those are the ones I can speak about for OSINT because those are the ones that I've I've been through. And I know um, Cynthia Herrington from the Herrington Group, uh, she offers a lot of different online trainings. And then she has Osmosis Con, which is all about OSINT. Osmosis Con is all about how to use OSINT in, in, in every field. So there's quite a few good, really good resources out there for for that type of training. And I think one of the things that's really great about our OSINT class, the one that Ryan teaches, is that Ryan emphasizes that the class is really going to be about getting the OSINT mentality, about being understanding of how it should work and less about the tools. Now, tools are great. Everybody needs to use tools in one way or another when they're performing OSINT. But if you've done some of the OSINT for any amount of time, one of the things that you very quickly find out is the tools break very quickly. The tools go away. Yeah. The tools become unsupported. So if you are just somebody that knows, you know, I'm going to use this tool for that. I'm going to use this other tool. When that tool breaks, now you're stuck. However, the way Ryan is teaching this class is really about the mentality and about how the pieces are going to fit together and how, like Chris just described, how we can start with a name, start with an email address and go all the way down to we get this full picture of the person in a way that we might end up with. It just walks right into the pretext. Like we started at the beginning, that OSINT is so important with being able to put together our pretexts. There are times that we sit at the beginning of a campaign. We're like, I got no idea what to do for a pretext here. But by the time you're done with your OSINT, the OSINT pretty much writes the pretext for you because it all just becomes super obvious as you're seeing all this information being laid out to you. It's like, well, if this is something that this person knows and believes, I'm just going to walk right in and, and use this as well. And it works pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and to me, it's like, I know we can spend a lot of time talking about OSINT because it's the, it is, it is the lifeblood of all social engineering Uh, trying to do any type of engagement without OSINT. It's, it just doesn't work. You know, it it really doesn't work. I mean, you, you may have some success, right. And, And people that may, and they may go, well, I have success and I barely do OSINT. That's possible. But the deeper you get into it, the bigger jobs you get, the more you're trying to help a client, uh, if it's just about you succeeding, yeah, you can find a person who will fall for a pretext that you have a generic one. But if you're really trying to help your client, then the best way to do that is you, you know, you really get deep involved in finding out all you can about them. And now when you reveal that, whether whatever you used and whatever you didn't use, now you're helping them also clean up things online that could be used by real attackers that, that would make them vulnerable. Because. From there, once you have your OSINT done and you're able to come up with your pretexts, now that's going to lead into that next step. Now that's going to lead into your practical social engineering. So, Chris, I think you also many years ago were faced with this idea of there is no good practical Hmm. social engineering class in existence. And you and some others had an idea to create one. Is that pretty much how that started? 
Yeah, I was working with offensive security at the time, and anyone who's ever taken an offset class knows they are just some of the best infosec training on the planet. That's why we all like if you have the OSCP, you like you brag about it, you revere that because that's it's just one of the best trainings. For me, coming from a very um, academic or school based background, offsec was like a whole new version of the world for me. Having this uh, try harder mentality, having to really figure things out, like presenting a problem over here. And then when you came over here, the principles you learned work, but they weren't the same. It wasn't cookie cutter. Uh, that really opened my eyes to, wow, I learned so much in that class. So when I started this company and started doing social engineering full time, I realized there was a huge gap in getting people trained to be in this field. But then I had this problem where it was easy with OFSEC. We go, well, we want to teach people how to hack uh, uh, Windows, you know, XP at the time. So, bam, you set up a Windows XP VM. Oh, you want to teach them how to do uh, OS X. OK, bam, you set up an OS X VM. And whatever VM you want, whatever you wanted to teach them to hack, you just set up a VM with it. Printers, network tools, whatever. Well, now I'm sitting here saying, well, I can't set up a VM for a human. And there's no... AI was not advanced enough to duplicate people. So I'm like, how do you practically teach and practice social engineering without doing what you said in the introduction, which was encourage people to do illegal or unethical or immoral things um, that that could hurt others or get you in trouble and land you in some serious hot water. So that was a that was a big challenge. And at, at one point I was um, writing this course out and I was. Uh, thinking about how to do this. And I had met um, Joe Navarro, a really good friend of mine. Um, he, he was, uh, he wrote the book, What Everybody Is Saying. And he's, um, uh, he's a, a body language expert, ex FBI agent. He was on the podcast. And uh, during our discussion, he said, you should meet my friend who's still working at the FBI, Robin Dreek. And, you know, you should talk to him. Um, so he introduced me to Robin and Robin came on the podcast. And I quickly saw that Robin and I had a lot of similar thoughts and using influence and rapport building and things like that. So I said to Robin, you know, when I found out his job was uh, basically recruiting spies, I said, well, that's like ad super advanced SE. Like that's, that's SE to the extreme. I said, how do you teach your people? And he started giving me the exercises that he would do for his group because he was a director of the, the BAU at the time. And I'm like, wait, wait. So you did this, this, and this. And I'm like, can I, can I steal that? And he's like, yeah, sure. And then he would give me another set and I'm like, can I try that? Like, and like, that's not wrong. And, he, no. and then I would go out and try it myself. And I'd be like, I can't believe how well this works. So I basically took all the things that he told me. I went out and tried them to myself. And then those became the homework assignments for the lessons I wanted to teach in APSE. So, and I remember when I first started APSE, it was called, um, um, social engineering for pen test professionals. That's what it was called. And uh, I'm now, let's say, two years into teaching the class. Yeah, two years, two or three years. And I had this class that I taught in Dublin, Ireland. So I set up a training in Dublin and I had maybe about 16 students. And I usually start off every class asking, you know, why are you here? Like, tell me what's your reason for being here so we can get help you get the most out of the class. And four people in that class were salespeople from car companies. I had two teachers in that class. I had a therapist in that class and I had a Zumba instructor in that class. And I remember saying to each one of them, I said, why are you guys in a social engineering pen test class? Like, I don't even understand what you're doing here. And each one of them had a very similar story. Somebody was, oh, my boyfriend's in InfoSec and he took this class and said, you need to take it. Um, IT guys came to this class and they said, we should send all of our salespeople. Like these stories were prevalent. I'm like, why? So I found out who referred them and I would go and talk to those students and I would say, so thanks for the referral. It was an amazing time. Can you tell me why you at, told her to come? And, and I would hear their thinking on it. And then I started to realize that this class wasn't just about pen testing or what we call adversarial simulation now. This class was so much more. It was about communications. It was about understanding human decision making. It was about reading people's nonverbals. So that's when we changed it to advanced practical social engineering. Is we realized that it had so much more to it than um, than just really SE for the you know for breaking into places or fishing and fishing, uh, and that that that's how the class became it. Kind of over the last decade, it evolved a lot, 
changed a lot. I rewrote a lot of things, got rid of stuff that science pr- disproved, um, added new things from new science. And now with a, a Dr. Morano here at our, at SECOM, I'm constantly getting new science that's, uh, that's adjusting the class. So it's like from what it was to what it is now, it's a wholly different beast, but it's, it's really awesome. And it's a four day class that kind of covers, um, uh, all the psychological and let's say even physiological principles of what makes someone make a decision, either yes or no, and then application, how you can use that as a social engineer. And I think one of the things that you just said is the class evolved. And I would say it's probably even evolved beyond being a social engineering class Hmm. because I took the class back in February of this year, 2022, when I started with the company, it was a class that I'd wanted to take for years. So I was very excited when I finally got to take it. I would say that it's, it's definitely got the social engineering aspect to it, but I would say it's more of a communications class. It's more Mm. of a, you learn how to communicate. And I would also say it's not even necessarily for you to learn how to communicate with others, because one of the the really valuable things that happens in the class is on day one, you learn about yourself. You you give people the uh, the the disc uh, the DIC DISC assessment, which is a uh, assessment of how you best communicate. So there's different communication styles. Some people are very dominant and direct, and other people are a little bit more <laughs> a little bit people a little more beat around the bush types. And if you want to know who are two people that are probably 180 degrees opposite on their communication types, well, you're listening to them right yeah. now. <laughs> because I think we are for, right. We are yes, across the circle, right? Yeah, we sure were. Chris is as direct and to the point as you can get. And I am probably somebody that will beat around the bush and not be quite so direct. So that was one of the most eye-opening things that I think that came from the class is for one, being able to understand what is your own personal communication type, what type that works for you, but also being able to understand how other disc types Mm. are and knowing how to communicate with them. So for example, now that I know that Chris uh, his disc type is going to be, uh, the, the direct or the, the D type in the, in the disc. I, I know that I need to be very short and to the point. I can't really beat around the bush because Chris is just going to like not really care about any of that so much. I just need to be like, Chris, this needs to get done. I need this and here's how it's going to happen. And he'll say, okay, or no, because of this and that. Where there are other types that are are more like me, where I'll just be like, hey, you know, it would be really kind of good if we could, you know, you've been doing really well with these sorts of things. So I was really thinking, how about if we do this instead, which, you know, that might work for a different type, doesn't work so much for Chris. But I learned too that, um, and this is the great part about about using a tool like DISC and understanding ourselves, is that just like you say, you would just uh, talk to me. I have to adjust to talk to you because it's uh, you are uh, as S's uh, you are very much into team, making sure the team is supported and that they feel good about their job. So when we're trying to maybe institute a new program or get get you know since you're the senior team leader you're all about the team that those changes we have to present them in a way that this is why it's going to help them and this is why it's going to be good and people listening you may think so you guys are just all day seeing each other no uh, think of don't think of it as manipulation or or social engineering someone when you communicate with someone the way that they enjoy being communicated with that's a kindness that's a gift. That's like if you say my favorite food is chicken parmesan and you come over to my house and I make you chicken parmesan, that's not me manipulating you. That's me giving you a gift saying I wanted to make this for you because it was your favorite. If you said I hate chicken parmesan and I gave it to you, then that's not very kind to me. That's me saying I don't care what you like. I'm going to do it my way. So it's, you know, when when we talk about communication this way, a lot of times people say, well, that just sounds like you're just getting your people to do things and that they don't want to do. No, it's communication because at that point, it's not like I say this in an S way and then you go, yes, Lord, and you just do it. No, you can still come back and go, that's not sure if that's really going to work or I don't know if I understand it. And that's what communication is all about is going back and forth and having a conversation. And that that's why I feel like that first part of that class is just direly important for us to understand. Yeah, I think that's a, a great distinction. And you also bring up conversations where at the beginning of this episode, 
when we were talking about social engineering and people getting started, that's often a, another thing that I like to try to get across to people where for some reason, social engineering just seems to have a negative connotation to so many yeah. people. So many people think it's just for criminals. It's just yeah. to do bad things. And one of the things that I try to get across to people is that I more see social engineering as just a conversation with a purpose hmm. where we're not really trying to harm anybody, where if we want to practice our social engineering – Go out and have a conversation with a purpose from somebody. Maybe your goal is to go out and learn more about the local area. Maybe you want to learn, like, where's the best place to go play basketball in a park? Like, hmm. none of that is manipulation. None of that is harmful. But that is all stuff that you can use to enhance your own communication skills. Now, Chris, you also mentioned that in APSE, there's homework. So this is not just a nine to five class. People can't just show up thinking, I'm just going to sit through a lecture and then I'm going to go out, you know, and relax all yeah. night long back in the hotel room or go hang out with, with friends. Or maybe you can hang out with friends, but there is homework to do. What yeah. types of things, what is this like written homework where people have to <laughs> write down answers on a paper or is it something different? No, this, so what we've designed is that we want like our, our methodology for training is we tell you, we show you, and then you do it. So the class time is mostly me telling or whoever else is co-training with me or, you know, we're telling the class the principles. Then we're showing you things. Usually there's videos or pictures or other parts that kind of solidify the principles we're talking about or tools and then doing it. So now you have to go out and engage with complete strangers. And again, we wanted to design this so it was ethical, that people wouldn't, I mean, of course, you're going to have some discomfort if you're nervous, but not discomfort because we're saying, go get a credit card. Or like we've heard before, go to an ATM and get get someone to give you money. Like not that, that's fraud. Like we don't want to do things like that, that make people feel bad. It's uh, it's like, hey, you, I love the one you said, and this is not a homework assignment. I don't want to give too much away. But like if you just wanted to know, hey, where's a good place to play basketball around here? Or what's the best restaurant in the area? Those are great things that you may not feel comfortable walking up to a complete stranger and asking, but then that will be your homework. And each night we progressively get more and more personal and that don't let, don't let anyone get afraid with that. So we're not going to ever get, you know, like we're never getting passwords. We're never getting financial information, but we get more and more personal because it requires more and more rapport to ask questions of that nature. And a lot of times what people, um, you know, they want to just jump right to what I, what I need. I need this piece of information. So I need to get it. And the harder the, the information, the more you have to think about, okay, how am I going to approach it? What am I going to present in this conversation? So it makes sense when I'm asking that. So the homework puts them in some pretty interesting spaces that they have to use critical thinking. Um, plus we, we build teams. So they have to be part of a team. So, uh, depending on the size of the class, there may be anywhere from two to four people in a team. So they're also now learning how to interact with people that they don't know, because if you come with a bunch of workmates, most likely we're breaking you up and we're not putting you with them. Um, and you get to see the power of working with other people. Cause I know from, from both you and Ryan have come from other companies. It's very rare to be sent out to an engagement with more than just yourself. And when I started this company, because of where I came with Offsec, we never did jobs alone. We were always with the team. So I, that was just my understanding. That's the way it should be. So we always do jobs together. Uh, it could be anywhere from two. I've had six people on a job before. Um, and we do that and you have to learn. Now, how do you handle all of these different personalities, different communication types, and you're all on the same job trying to accomplish the same goal, right? And, uh, that part of the class, I feel, is maybe some of the the, the most important parts, right, uh, for, for, for people who, who learn. That's like the most important parts for them. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I, I think what you're really describing is that homework truly is having that conversation with a purpose where you are just engaging somebody that you've never seen before at any time in your life. And you're trying to just talk to them yes. about some specific information. And one of the things that I remember about the homework is when you assigned it on day one, I think everybody in the room kind of felt the same way, like, oh, that's going to be hard. How in the <laughs> world am I going to get that information from somebody? But then by day three, or even at the after <laughs> the last day, 
when you look back at the homework we had on day one, it's like, man, that was easy. Yeah. You know, like th- that was no problem. I can go out and do that anywhere, anytime. So it just really shows how people progress over time. And I even remember in the class that I took, there were people who literally said the class was life changing for mm. them, where it really uh, changed them in terms of being able to give them the confidence to show the types of things that they were capable of that they never thought before three days earlier that they were even necessarily capable of at all. Um, but when people complete the class for so many other cert, so many other classes, there's usually a certification step. Do, is there any kind of certification step that you have yeah. available for this class? <laughs> yeah. So um, it, again, it, it came back to how do we create something practical? Because I don't want to just ask questions like, hey, tell me the three best ways to fish someone. And then, you know, you, you write it down on a piece of paper and you pass. But I wanted to see actual skills. So, again, following the the offensive security methodology, how can you create a cert that puts people under pressure for X amount of hours to prove that they actually can do the work? So I created a fake company and I'm not going to give too much detail out about this here because we've successfully been able to, um, you know, help use this company for training for over a decade now. But I use a fake company that has, um, actual, uh, fake employees, you know, that look like they're real online. And then we have some real people that work for this fake company. And your job over 48 hours is to do an SE only adversarial simulation of that company. So you get to fish, fish, do tons of OSINT. And as we talked about before, you have to write a report and report is 50% of your score. So you may be awesome at fishing, fishing, impersonation, influence, but if you can't, um, if you can't write it all down in a professional manner, I've seen people who've gotten every flag you need, but failed because their, their report was like one page and we're like, we don't even know what you did. You know, so the report is just so important. You have 48 hours to do it, 48 hours to get it in and submit it. Um, and, and, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a really, I don't want to say, I don't want to paint it too much like it's so difficult because it's not that it's so difficult, but it takes all of your mental faculties. Like you can't be at work doing this cert. You know, a lot of times when people take this, they, they ask their families to leave for 48 hours and go to a hotel or something. So they have the house to themselves, you know, and, and they really work all, like a lot of people tell me they take almost all the 48 hours. I think uh, one of our employees, Rosa, she said that she, like she was at the 44 hour mark. You know, and then was like, okay, I think I, I think I'm ready to submit the report, right? <laughs> um, so it's it's uh, and that's person who has experience writing reports because she does it here, right? So uh, it, it's uh, it's a we and you know just so if people wonder, we make every employee that does operational work here go through the cert, and every employee in the company has to go through the course. So if you're gonna work here, you have to go through it because you have to understand our foundational principles of what it is that we do. And if you're going to be a part of the uh, operational team, you have to get the cert because that's one of our things we say is that every employee that does the work for you is a certified social engineer. And, and you know, and and there's a huge part of the cert, which is creating a security incident, um, using fear based pretexts or making uh, a target feel like they're in danger. Can you fail the certification automatically? So you can't pa- no matter how good you did, you can't pass. Uh, and we've had some students fail for that, like where they they use pretexts that were you're thinking, why would you ever do that? And it just created fear for these secretaries that work there. And they don't know that it's a certification. So they they got afraid and they thought things were really bad for the company. Um, so that creates fear. And then people, you can't pass with that. After people take the APSC class and they get certified, I'm sure that you've probably heard from lots of people. They're super excited. That's been a whole lot of fun. Is there anything else that they can do? Is there anything to do beyond the APSC class? Yeah, so we built two other classes. Um, the first is called CIRA, so Social Engineering Risk Assessment, because one of the things that we had people asking was, great, I went to APSC, I went to your OSINT class, but now I don't know how to actually do phishing and vishing. Like I did it for the cert and it was okay. I did okay. I felt I did okay, but I don't know how to do it better. So we had um, some of our operational team actually write a course they assisted in writing a uh, Kurt and Shelby and myself we got together and we wrote this course that is how to conduct social engineering risk assessment so how to you know take the OSINT for you did in the OSINT class and now apply that to both 
creating phishing uh, vectors and then writing phishing emails and creating vishing vectors and then writing, you know, not scripts per se out, but writing out your idea for the vishing and then um, conducting those attacks. And you actually do you during that class, you conduct those attacks, you do that. Uh, so that class is, is a three day class um, that we, we utilize all that time basically for pure attack vector. So you come to that. If you've been through APSE and OSINT before, this one just dives right into here's how you use this for attack. Um, and then, of course, as it goes, people kept asking, you know, well, what's the next stage? Like, what do we do now? And um, and for years, I mean, literally for probably five or six years, I told people there's nothing else. I have nothing else to teach. Like, this is it. This is the pinnacle. And then one person said to me, but you never taught me how to do physical SE work. And I went. Yeah, you're right. I didn't. I don't know how I can teach that. So back to the drawing board, sitting down, like, how can I possibly teach it? And I went and I actually asked a lawyer, um, what makes this illegal? And he said, well, uh, to make it, uh, he goes, here's what I could do to tell you to make it legal is you'd have to own both ends because you can't give permission to break into a place without getting permission. So you either have to get a company that's willing to say, yes, you can break in. And you can hack my people, uh, like basically an approved, you know, adversarial simulation, or you have to own both ends of it. So I'm like, okay. So actually our very first iteration of MLSE, it's master's level social engineer. We had a really large company that had agreed to be our target. And we were sitting in a meeting with them, with their lawyers. It was all over the internet. And, um, I, I'm not going to use real names because I don't want to embarrass any company, but let's just say it was a, and it wasn't, but let's just say it was a big food company. So let's just say it was like McDonald's and it was not right. But let's just say that um, their lawyer said, well, nobody from Burger King could be in your class. And I went, well, I, I can't limit the students. And they're like, but we can't have competitors breaking into our stuff. And I went, but I have students from Burger King, quote unquote. How do I tell them? Sorry, you're never allowed to sign up for this class. I'm like, that's not our problem. And I'm like, well, it is our problem because I can't sign this, right? So here I thought we had this great deal and I had to say, nope, sorry, can't do it. So then back to the drawing board and I'm like, how do I do the other part of it, which is owning both ends? And that's when I basically took the fake company that I created that we talked about before and I hire a director who gets actors who think they're coming in to our office that we built to um, help do sales training and mystery shopping for the week. This is what we tell them. They get to run around doing their tasks. And then my students, our students, get to break into an office building. They get to clone RFID, pick locks. They get to hack their computers and phones because the computers and phones they use, we own them. All week, they get to use our material. Um, they get to, we rent cars for them so they can GPS track their cars. So we, they get to do all the stuff that you would do in an actual physical engagement and they do it because we own both ends. And people sometimes will look at me and go, you're nuts. Like, how is this even possible? And I can't answer that question. All I know is my team uh, here at SCCOM is amazing. And, uh, and without Amanda and Ryan and everyone else, uh, the last couple of years, you've been a part of it. Uh, everyone here that just works their, their butts off to make this happen. Um, we do, we pull it off, but like, you know, we, it takes us months and months and months of planning. And then that week we basically shut the company down so everybody could focus on this class and we pull it off. And it's been, it's been amazing. You know, we've had, we just did our sixth year, fifth year, our fifth year of it. No, sixth year. We did our sixth year of the training. And um again, like you said, people come up and they say, this has been the best class of my life. It's, it's changed the way I look at everything. And, um, you know, and it, and it's teaching something very valuable for people who want to be in this industry without having to break the law or just give you concepts. And I think one of the other interesting things that you have done with that MLSE class is it's not available necessarily directly to the public. What does it take in order for somebody to be able to sign up for MLSE? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, people often ask that because they hear this, they run to the website, they see the MLSE thing, they go there and there's no sign up. Um, to, to, to be in, you have to, in, MLSE is an invite only class. So you have to have come to APSE and graduated the class. That doesn't mean take the cert. We love it if you do take the cert, but graduating the class means that you need to have come accomplished all the work that you have not left anyone feeling worse for having met you. 
that you didn't disrupt the class with stupidity. Uh, we've had some students who come in and like hit on some of the women that are in the class. It's not even our, our, our instructors um, disrupting the class with you know weird harassing statements or things like that. You just you'll never be invited to MLSE because MLSE uh, first it's it's limited to 16 people a year. That's it. We can't do any more. We only teach it once a year. Um, and, and it's invite only class. And when you come into this, we are a closed unit team of 16 people for that week. The class, uh, this last one we just did, we never ended before 2 a.m. Starting at 9 a.m., we never ended before 2 a.m. because you're doing nighttime break ins, you're doing, you know, tracking of cars, you uh, we just did so much stuff. So, um, so you're, you know, you're doing all this stuff and it, it's a, it's a, 18, 17, 18 hour per day class. So we need people that we know we can trust to be in that room. And that means it's a, it's a wholly, wholly different class. I don't even know if I should announce this on this podcast because Ryan may kill me, but we came up (laughs) with MLSE version two last week. So for people who've already been through it, who asked, what can we do more? We actually came up with a whole nother version that is even hairier. So. And you and Ryan are right now heads down trying to come up with all the final details on all of that. So that's going to be just amazing because I think everything that we've talked about here is really an end to end how to become a social engineer and how to get into this field all the way from ideas of things that you can do in college to being able to take OSINT classes, jumping into the APSC class or taking that CIRA class with the fishing and the vishing. Mm-hmm. And then once you've gone through all of that, think about whether you want to take the master's level social engineering, the MLSE class. And this time of the year is probably a great time to start thinking about that because I know lots of people have New Year's resolutions, new <laughs> training. So many companies are like, let me know what training you want to do in the, in the new year. And I know so many people want to learn social engineering. So I think this is probably a great time for people to be thinking about any of those classes that they might want to take with us. Yeah, think of it that way. Yeah, it's an interesting field to be in. Uh, I got to say for, for now being here for just about 20 years, um, for me, it's a, it's a field that I don't get bored with. And I found myself getting bored with every job I've ever had since I was a kid. Uh, I'm always learning. I never feel like I've mastered this. Uh, just the other day, I was telling someone that, you know, brand new people come into our company who have zero experience in InfoSec and then figure something out on a vision call. And I go, I'd never thought of that. And it seems to happen all the time to me. So I, I'm, I, for me, what I love about that is it means I'm not done. I have a lot more to learn. I have a lot more that I can actually learn about with, with, with this field. So I don't find myself getting bored. I actually really enjoy it. And if you're looking for a career change or a career that could be really exciting, um, the, the one thing I'll say about this though is that don't think it's all excitement, right? It, they're like the report writing is definitely boring and nobody loves that. Um, and it's, you know, you're, you're getting paid to, like you said, you hack for free and that's a small piece of the pie. And then dealing with clients and dealing with vendors and dealing with reports and dealing with data, that's the biggest pieces of the pie. So, uh, you know, but I'm not saying that to be negative. It's just that come in with real expectations. And when you succeed, you do things like make companies more secure. And that feels good. That feels good to go to sleep at night. And you see our clients, like we talk about all the time, clients that, we're un- enamored by our success and like, what can we do to be better? And then they do it. And next month it's harder for us. And we're like, Oh, that's awesome. You know, that's great. And that feels good to be part of an industry where we're really helping companies stay secure. And you mentioned that it's never boring. And I would often say one of the things that I really like about social engineering is that it is always different because I could, Previous to working here at Social Engineer, I was your very stereotypical pen tester, which is basically, here's this network, here are these computers, see if you can get in. And one of the things that I learned is like, okay, a Windows XP computer is a Windows XP computer. If it's got the patch level, it's going to be the exact same thing every single time. It's the opposite with social engineering. <laughs> yeah. You never find any two people that are going to be the same. There is no single exploit that works on everybody. No. Whereas inside of a network, one single expert exploit works the same way right. on the same patch level of every computer. 
And it's just the opposite with social engineering, which is exactly why it's never boring as you yeah. go through and as you do new engagements, it's just all different people and you learn new things, new techniques, new ways every single day. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's a great topic. And, um, you know, and, and again, um, just as we finish up, you know, it's not, I can't talk about training that I've never been to. So I know there's other classes out there and there's other things and uh, I'd be more than happy. Uh, people want to write in or they come in the Slack channel to talk about trainings they've taken that they found really successful and, and great. Um, and the ones that I mentioned that I took are ones that I love talking about. I've taken trainings that I would not recommend because they weren't great, but I, you know, the ones that I take that I really like, uh, I'd be more than I happy to talk about them. And that's what we did here. But, um, you know, I'm sure we're going to start seeing a shift into more college level SE courses and something um, in, in closing I'm really excited about is for the last few months, I've been working with a, a STEM high school out in Arkansas and we developed a whole year social engineering curriculum for their students out there. And uh, they're, they're actually going to be performing some social engineering engagements and things like that as the ending of their, their program. And this has got support from the mayor um, and it's a really big deal. It's the first time a high school is bringing these skills to kids of that age. And I think that's the right time. It's the right time. Children of that age are being, uh, exploited by bad people. Uh, that's what we do at, you know, try to protect at ILF, um, using the v very similar skills to what we teach. Um, and, and the kids understanding that can keep them safer, but it also can give them that itch to want to be in this industry because we need it. Right. I mean, you and I want to retire someday. Right. I don't want to be doing this when I'm 70. Right. I want to be, I want to be sitting on a beach somewhere with a nice cocktail, you know, a good whiskey or something. So I, we need, we need the you know, next generation to step up and come on in and take our jobs from us. So I'm all for helping anywhere we can to get that education uh, worked up. But Can't thanks. Wait. Great topic today. Absolutely. And I think uh, next month for the social engineering, et cetera podcast. I think we're going to have a guest. We're going to have uh, be joined by someone else next we month. We can't which wait. Should be a whole lot of fun the first time for us. And and we'll just give you a little teaser. Uh, Patrick picked a topic, SE dumpster dive. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you any more about it, but the guest is definitely uh, an interesting one. Our first time with a guest on this series, and the story is going to be great. Can't wait. Well, thanks, Patrick. Another great conversation. So thanks everyone for listening. Please feel free to leave us comments in the, in the uh, comment section on whatever platform you're on. Of course, we love to get reviews of the podcast. And if you have ideas for episodes you want to hear on this series, jump on into the Slack or leave them in a comment section. We're taking all of the suggestions and I'm not saying we'll be able to do every single one, but if we get a suggestion that we hear often, we'll definitely add it to the list. And uh, that's really been helping us with all the series for the SE podcast. Until next month, see ya.